Yeah, so a little while ago, I did a presentation for the other testers on an overview of co-location, what co-location was about. And in doing so, I ended up looking at a lot of sales brochures, the data centers for Next Center, and there's some actually some really cool stuff in there. So what I've done for this presentation is I've taken out the stuff about using the portal, the stuff that testers need to know, and have just focused on the cool and interesting stuff that I found in the data centers we, we have. All right. So Next Center is the branding for the NTT data centers. We've got over 140 worldwide and over 350,000 meters squared of service space. So in the co-location, the customer would be paying to, they'd have a rack in the data center, which they'd put in their own servers and the data center would supply the power and the connectivity for the, for the rack. You could also buy, so there's the service level is, you can have a rack, you can also have a cage in the, in the data center dedicated to that customer. Or you can have a suite, which is like an entire room just for that customer in the data center. Yeah, and the, the data centers are all over the world. You've got some in America, Asia, Europe. So it's like a global interconnected data center uh, <coughs> with over 300,000 companies using it. And that number's increasing all the time. I think if this sounds like an advertisement, it's because I've gotten a lot of this from the sales brochures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they've won loads of awards. It's really reliable. <laughs> yeah, so it's got state-of-the-art power, security, climate control, fire protection, seismic isolation, and connectivity. I'm going to try and break it down into each area and talk about each part a little bit. So firstly, power. This is the two power receiving units in the Osaka DC. So each, each power receiving unit is linked to a different substation. So if one substation fails, there's still another, a different substation supplying power to the DC. And then if both fail, there's always backup generators on site. So we've got um, a, a backup generators in Hemel Hempstead and backup generators in Frankfurt. And they have contracts with diesel suppliers so they can guarantee the power will always be there. And here in Hemel Hempstead, they're in a 2N configuration. And in Frankfurt, an N plus 1 configuration. And that is... So it takes N generators to supply power for the entire DC. So the N plus one configuration is they have one extra generator. Uh, two N is they have twice the number of generators that they need. And two N plus two is we've got twice as many plus two, which sounds like a lot, but Virginia Ashburn in America has that configuration. So it lets them, so they can shut off like half the system and, and do upgrades to, to half the generators without risking power loss. There's also backup battery supplies. We've got these are in Frankfurt, DC. And here are the backup battery supplies in Virginia Ashburn, DC, in America. And there's an innovative monitoring system so that they're always ready, they have power in them, so that if they're ever needed, they'll be there. And this is a rotary UPS generator, which is one of the more advanced systems. So it's in Tokyo 6 DC, which was the first data center to get a generator of this type. It has three modes, which are conditioning, transfer, and engine. In conditioning, power is being supplied to the DC. So there's a flywheel inside the generator that's constantly spinning with that power. Then if power is lost, it goes into transfer mode. The flywheel then gives power back into the data center and gives time, 10 seconds of time for the engine to start up. So the generator is now ready to take over and supply power to the data center. This also have state-of-the-art security. So I've kind of mapped out a path that you might take in going into, your, into the data center and into the, into the rack. So here we start outside. We're in Jakarta, DC. And there's a card checking station where you'd have to check with the guard. You'll check your card. And there's a bollard to prevent people just driving in. <laughs> And once you get inside, it's like an airport. There'll be a baggage scanner, an x-ray scanner, and you'd have to go for a metal detector. Then there's something called a man trap, which is in Virginia Ashburn, DC. So outside is the public area, and on the other side is the private data center area. And you have to pass through the man trap <coughs> in order to get there. So if an intruder tries to enter the data center, they'll get caught into the man trap. 
And once they ex enter this, they won't be able to exit until the security arrives and takes them away. Here's the reception area. So once you're in the data center, you'd have to speak to reception. You're only allowed to visit if you booked in advance and that booking has been approved. And you'd get a card to an internal card for the data center at this point to let you access any rooms in the data center. Then you'd have to go through the, the security gates to check these cards. On here we have uh, biometric scanners, which check finger vein authentication, so that you know who you're dealing with, as long as the card reader as well. Then we'll go to the elevator, and there's an implantation limit. So you can only go where you've booked to go, where it's been approved, so you'll scan your card. And if you try to go to a floor you're not allowed to, it won't allow that. And then we'll get to outside the security, uh, to the server room. This is something called a tailgating prevention device. So it allows one person in at a time. So each person has to go through the biometric authentication at a time. So you can't just have someone following another person in when they shouldn't be there. Uh, this is a finger vein, uh, another fingerprint scanner. But there's also more sophisticated ones like the, an iris scanner. This one's in Hemel Hempstead, DC. It's pretty cool. And then even then, once you're in the server room, this is a dedicated cage for a customer. So that's an extra layer of security around there, and only that customer can enter the cage. And then even past that, there's a rack lock. So you can't get into the rack unless you have the combination. So there's layers of security all the way, preventing anyone from being able to get in. And at every step of the way, there's a 24-7 security CCTV being monitored. So it's pretty hard to break in, I gather. Yeah, and so they also have state-of-the-art climate control. So they have something called a cooling wall system, which you can see a little bit of here. So hot air will be moved. So hot air from the rack will move up around the side and move back into the rack when it's cooled to recall it down. And the cooling wall is kept cool by devices we'll have on the roof, which we'll get to in a sec. Yeah, and so we have a cascade air conditioning system in Takamatsu, DC. So if cold air will enter in the bottom of the building and move its way up into the server rooms, cooling them down, and then eventually it will reach the roof where it will get to the cooling systems we have there. And here's the primary water cooling system in uh, Virginia, Ashburn, DC. So it's utilizing three sources of water, so they can always guarantee it. One site's a well on the site. A second is uh, re reclaimed water, gray water. And a third is potable drinking, normal water from the uh, water supplies. So that's the primary system. There's also a secondary air cooling system, which they also have. So by using the cold outside air, they can improve energy efficiency. It's much cheaper. So we've got, um, here in Frankfurt, D.C., they've got a system where if the temperature is above 14 degrees C, then the, before the air is pumped into the building, it will go through two heat transfer pumps to, take the, to cool down the air before it goes in. And once the air outside drops below 14 degrees C, it's just pumped directly into the building without the cooling going, happening first to save energy and money. And also the customer can monitor the temperature and humidity as well. So they can get a graph of the temperature and humidity in the rooms that their racks are in, so they know. Okay, there's also state-of-the-art fire protection systems. So this is a more traditional one in Cyber Hire, which is a purified water mist fire suppression system, so sprinklers. There's always an obvious downside to this in that if you're spraying water all over servers, they're going to get damaged. So other data centers use something a bit more sophisticated called uh, nitrogen gas fire suppression. So um, this is called fire protection VESDA, which I'll come back to. So nitrogen gas is then pumped into the server rooms at the first sign of the fire. So the way this works is this is the normal air content you find anywhere on Earth. It's around 21% oxygen. So they pump nitrogen into the rooms, so the oxygen will then drop below 15%, and most fires can't be sustained once the oxygen level gets below 15%, they'll go out. 
this has the advantage of, uh, so people can still breathe with that amount of oxygen as well. So in the past, uh, they had like carbon dioxide systems were used, but that's harmful to humans and there were some casualties. I think uh, halogen systems were used in the past, even before that as well, but that damaged the ozone layer, so those were stopped. Okay, so I mentioned fire protection VESDA, which is a very early smoke detection apparatus. So it sucks in air at the top using like vacuum pumps. And this goes through a laser, which then detects any, uh, detects any smoke very quickly. <laughs> right. And here we have uh, one of the Tokyo DCs. It has a seismic isolation pit underneath of it. So it's a very earthquake prone area. So I want to be able to guarantee that the data center itself won't be damaged. So they use multiple types of seismic isolation devices. So the, the, the data center is floating above the ground almost. And any movement is it's allowed to move, but it, the, the acceleration is like slowed down and reduced. So we've got a sliding elastic support board, an oil damper, a linear sliding board, and a laminated rubber shoe with a lead plug. These have like layers of uh, steel and rubber discs going up. And I've got a little video of this being tested. So they're getting the, the lead shoe and they're applying the weight of a data center above it, <coughs> simulating that, and then showing what happens when the ground moves underneath of it. It allows quite a lot of movement. All right. And using all of this stuff, they managed to reduce the effects of an earthquake by up to 80%. So from the great, the great East Japan earthquake of 2011, the data center only moved 43 millimeters, which is quite amazing. There's also state-of-the-art connectivity. So if you're in an entity data center, you get access to entity's global high-speed network. Access to Entity Communications Global Backbone. So here's a communication center in Osaka, DC, where the communications are laid in four directions and directly to earthquake-proof tunnels. And here's the main distribution facility in Virginia, Ashburn, DC. They have access to hundreds of telecommunications providers. And it's all combined into a state-of-the-art facility. And there's some little extra stuff I thought was quite cool, which didn't really fit into the other layout. So you've got normal stuff you'd expect, like a meeting room, but they've also got climbing walls, exercise rooms, showers, uh, games rooms, just to lure customers in. Also like a rooftop garden in Cyber Haya, I think. And there's a heliport in Osaka, DC. And one other cool thing is something called visual remote hands. So I'm a customer and I want something done to my, the server that I have in the data center. So I can have an operator wearing uh, a camera and a voice device. We can have a call on the, on the pad while he goes and does the work. So I can see exactly what he sees while he does the work and tell him exactly what needs to be done. All right, that's it. All right, thank you for listening.